tonight. Reinforcing ties. Putin and Xi to strengthen Russia-China alliance at Eurasian Summit, challenging Western influence with expanded Shanghai Corporation organization. Labour leads. The UK braces for a historic election as Labour challenges the Conservatives' 14-year rule amid scandals and rapid campaigning, with voters set to decide tomorrow. Biden pressured. Democrats urge Biden to bow out of 2024 race, citing debate stumbles and poor woes to prevent Trump's authoritarian takeover. Millennial Saint Teen tech whizzed up God's influences said to become the Catholic Church's first millennial saint, merging miracles, faith and digital savvy. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Sanuvi Mudanayaka. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. We've got a number of key stories to update you on today and we start with updates on diplomacy in the Eurasian region. Russian President Vladimir Putin and China's Xi Jinping will meet at a Eurasian Security Summit to counter U.S. influence. The Shanghai Cooperation Organization, founded in 2001 by Russia and China, now includes India, Iran and Pakistan as a counterweight to the West. Russian and Chinese leaders attended a regional summit in Kazakhstan aiming to strengthen anti-Western alliances and expand their influence in Central Asia. The Shanghai Cooperation Organization meeting involving Russia, China, Central Asia countries, India and Iran is seen by Moscow and Beijing as crucial for advancing their strategic interests across Eurasia. Both nations have intensified their political, military and economic ties since Russia's invasion of Ukraine positioning the SCO and BRICS as key platforms for promoting a new world order. Central Asia's strategic importance to China's Belt and Road Initiative and its natural resources make it a contested region between Russia and China. The summit also provided opportunities for bilateral meetings, including a potential discussion between Russian President Putin and Turkish President Erdogan. Over to India now. A crowd crush at a religious gathering in northern India led to over 100 deaths due to overcrowding and insufficient police presence. The incident occurred at a gathering in Uttar Pradesh led by self-styled godman Bole Baba. A stampede at a Hindu religious event in northern India on Tuesday has resulted in scores of deaths and more than two dozen people injured, according to news agency ANI. The number of people present was more than triple the permitted capacity. The tragedy took place at a village in the Hatras district of Uttar Pradesh state, where a quarter of a million people attended an event that only had permission for 80,000. Most of the dead were women, along with several children, according to state officials. The police report also described a scene of utter chaos when the preacher of the congregation at the event, known as Bole Baba, was leaving his car. The report goes on to say thousands of devotees shouted and ran towards the car, crushing others still sitting in the gathering. Some people also fell into a nearby field of slush and mud and were trampled there. Local media said the event was organized by a group of devotees but did not identify anyone. Police were trying to determine the whereabouts of the preacher. Police officials in Hatras were not immediately available for comment. Now for a look at the British Isles. Britain is set to elect a new government, with Labour's Keir Starmer leading by 20% over the Conservatives. This change is driven by economic struggles, public service issues and dissatisfaction with the Conservative Party's handling of Brexit and the COVID-19 pandemic. A frantic election campaign kicked off barely six weeks ago after a hurried announcement by Prime Minister Rishi Sunak made in the pouring rain. Now is the moment for Britain to choose its future, to decide whether we want to build on the progress we have made or risk going back to square one. But it's precisely this argument from the Conservatives that's got them poised for a washout. Britain is grappling with the cost of living crisis and the party that's been in power for the past 14 years is being blamed. Under their watch, Britain has left the EU, billions have been cut from public spending and the prices of food and energy have soared. A reality that's got high-profile Conservatives on course for a historic defeat. 
The opposition Labour is poised to secure huge gains in Thursday's vote. Its leader, Keir Starmer, is credited with revamping the party and appealing to voters looking for change. Under my leadership, we have taken this party, we have changed it. What we're asking now is for the opportunity to do the same for our country. 650 seats are up for grabs in the House of Commons on Thursday, and a party needs 326 to form a government. Heading to France, opponents of the French National Rally intensified efforts to prevent the far-right party from gaining power, with over 200 candidates withdrawing to prevent splitting the anti-RN vote in the upcoming election for France's 577-seat national parliament. Opponents of France's national rally stepped up their bid to block the far-right party of Marine Le Pen from power on Tuesday as more than 200 candidates agreed to pull out of this weekend's runoff election, according to local media reports. The dropouts include those who finished in third place in the first round of voting, and they are quitting the race as part of a strategy to create a Republican front to block the anti-immigrant Eurosceptic party. Le Pen's party came out well ahead in Sunday's first round vote after President Emmanuel Macron's gamble on a snap election backfired leaving his centrist camp in a lowly third-place position behind the national rally and a hastily formed left-wing alliance. Still, it was far from clear national rally could win the 289 seats needed for a majority, and that was before the coalition maneuvering of the last 24 hours. But national rally lawmakers, including Laure Lavalette, who won her race in the election's first round, remained confident. I think that the French are very disappointed with these dealings, these behind-the-scenes dealings, and I am convinced that we will obviously have the absolute majority to be able to truly change the daily lives of the French. The Republican Front approach has worked before, such as in 2002 when voters of all stripes rallied behind Jacques Chirac to defeat Le Pen's father, Jean-Marie, in a presidential contest. However, it is not certain voters these days are willing to follow guidance from political leaders on where to place their vote. While Marine Le Pen's efforts to soften the image of her party has made it less of a pariah for millions. Let's take a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. On the road to the White House, Trump's sentencing has been postponed while his legal team challenges his conviction in light of a Supreme Court ruling granting partial immunity to former presidents for official acts. Initially scheduled for the 11th of July, the new sentencing date will be September 18th if necessary, following addition on the motions by September 6th. Donald Trump had been set to be sentenced next week for illegally concealing hush money payments to an adult film star. But that was before the U.S. Supreme Court on Monday ruled that former presidents enjoyed immunity from criminal prosecution for official acts taken while in office. And a New York judge on Tuesday agreed to delay Trump's sentencing until September 18th. The change comes after Trump's attorneys argued the Supreme Court's decision means the first former president to be criminally convicted should have his conviction overturned. Prosecutors with Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg's office said earlier on Tuesday that Trump's argument was, quote, without merit, but agreed to delay the sentencing to give Trump the chance to make his case. In a written ruling, New York Justice Juan Merchant said he would rule on Trump's request by September 6th, with sentencing to follow less than two weeks later, should the judge decide to uphold the conviction. Trump's lawyers must submit their arguments by July 10th, and prosecutors face a July 24th deadline to respond. A New York jury found Trump guilty on 34 counts relating to the illegal concealment of payments to Stormy Daniels in an effort to buy her silence about what she says was a sexual affair with the former reality TV star. Trump pleaded not guilty and denies the affair. The sentencing had previously been set for July 11th, just days before the Republican National Convention begins in Milwaukee. The new timeline means Trump will likely have been nominated by his party to challenge Democratic President Joe Biden by the time he is sentenced. 
Justice Juan Merchan will now decide Trump's punishment, including whether to jail him, in the thick of the general election campaign ahead of the November 5th election. Trump faces an uphill battle getting the hush money conviction overturned, since much of the conduct at issue in the case predated his time in office. For the first time, a Democrat lawmaker has voiced his opposition to U.S. President Joe Biden's run for a second term, following what's being widely viewed as a poor performance by Biden during the televised debate against Donald Trump last week. For the first time, a House Democrat has publicly called for U.S. President Joe Biden to step down as the party's candidate for the upcoming November presidential election. According to Democrat House Representative Lloyd Doggett of Texas on Tuesday, Biden should make the painful and difficult decision to withdraw, citing the president's poor performance during last week's televised debate with former President Donald Trump. However, Doggett stressed that his remarks do not in any way diminish his respect for Biden's achievements, adding that the incumbent president has always prioritized his country, unlike his opponent. While a number of Democrats have voiced concerns for Biden's bid for a second term behind closed doors, Doggett is the first to openly express his concerns and opposition. Responding to these concerns, White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre said Tuesday that the top office respects the opinions and thoughts of concerned party members. Amid rumors that Biden could potentially be replaced, a survey was conducted by CNN on 1,274 people from June 28th to 30th, shortly after the presidential debate. The survey asked participants who would win in a hypothetical matchup if Biden was to drop out of the race. Most hypothetical Democrat presidential candidates had less support than Trump, including Vice President Kamala Harris and California Governor Gavin Newsom. However, when asked who would win in the November presidential election between former First Lady Michelle Obama and Trump, 50 percent of respondents chose the former First Lady, compared to Trump, who had 39 percent support. Meanwhile, in the same survey, 49 percent said they would vote for Trump, compared to 43 percent who showed support for Biden. Australian police arrested a 14-year-old boy after a stabbing at the University of Sydney, which triggered a lockdown of the university buildings. For more on this, we have other than a World News Special Correspondent, Binet Seniviratna from Melbourne in Australia. Yes, Samadhi. New South Wales Police Assistant Commissioner of Counterterrorism said that the boy's motive or ideology has not yet been determined, but expressed concern at increasing evidence of young people being radicalised online. Police said the alleged attacker boarded a bus after the incident and was arrested near a hospital. There is not, no ongoing risk to the community and the victim and the alleged attacker were not known to each other. The attack comes about two months after six people were killed and 12 injured in a knife attack at a mall in Sydney, Sydney's Bondi area. And the Syrian church bishop was wounded in an unrelated stabbing attack during the service in Sydney's West. Back to you, Sanabi. Thank you. That was other than in World News Special Correspondent Binet Sinirathna from Melbourne in Australia. An update on the Israel-Hamas war. Israeli forces bombarded southern Gaza Strip and thousands of Palestinians fled their homes in what could be part of a final push of Israel's insensitive military operations in nine months of war. Israeli forces bombarded several areas of the southern Gaza Strip on Tuesday in what could be part of its final push in nine months of war. It comes after Israel ordered residents of several towns and villages surrounding Khan Yunis and Rafa to evacuate the day before. An evacuation of such a massive scale would only heighten the suffering of civilians and drive humanitarian needs even higher. United Nations spokesman Stefan Dujaric said it was the largest evacuation order in the Strip since 1.1 million people were told to leave the north of the enclave in October, citing figures from the UN Palestinian refugee agency UNRWA. People are left with the impossible choice of having to relocate, some most likely for the second or even the third time, to areas that have barely any space or services, or stay in an area where they know the fighting will take place. Thousands who had not heeded evacuation orders were forced to flee their homes overnight during the Israeli bombardment. Gaza's European hospital in Khan Yunis, which the emergency department director says has provided continuous daily services since the beginning of the war, was forced to evacuate. 
Israel's leaders have said they were winding down the phase of intense fighting against Hamas, the Islamist group that has governed Gaza since 2007, and would soon shift to more targeted operations. The war in Gaza began when Hamas burst into southern Israel on October 7th, killed 1,200 people and took around 250 hostages, according to Israeli tallies. The offensive launched by Israel in retaliation has killed nearly 38,000 people, according to the Gaza Health Ministry, and has left the coastal enclave in ruins. Kenyan police have fired tear gas in the capital, Nairobi, and the coastal city of Mombasa to disperse anti-government protests. President Ruto has since dropped the proposed tax increases, but the demonstrations have morphed into calls for him to resign and anger over police brutality in the past protests. Riot police clashed with protesters in Nairobi on Tuesday as violence returned to the streets of Kenya's capital. That's after young activists called for more demonstrations following a week of deadly clashes. Clouds of tear gas wafted over downtown Nairobi after protesters set fires on the main road through the capital and threw stones at police in the central business district. We are here. The protests, sparked by proposed tax hikes, have morphed into a wider nationwide movement against corruption and misgovernance. President William Ruto has abandoned the tax hikes in a proposed finance bill, but his calls for dialogue have been rejected. <laughs> Elsewhere on Tuesday, Kenyan television showed demonstrations taking place in towns and cities across the country. Hundreds marched peacefully in the port city Mombasa, carrying palm fronds and chanting, Ruto must go. Many protesters are calling for Ruto to step down, infuriated at the deaths of dozens of Kenyans since June 18th, most of them shot by police last Tuesday. On that day, Parliament was briefly stormed and parts of it set ablaze, and police opened fire. Ruto has defended the actions of the police and blamed the violence on so-called criminals who hijacked the demonstrations. Hurricane Burial, a historic storm, has killed at least six people in the Caribbean and is heading towards Jamaica with life-threatening winds and storm surge. Burial is the earliest recorded Category 5 hurricane in the Atlantic with peak winds of 165 mph. Tonight, the monster storm pummeling the Caribbean with drenching rain and life-threatening winds and storm surge. That was bad. That was bad. Hurricane Barrel, now barreling towards Jamaica, has a potentially catastrophic Category 4, expected to be the worst storm to hit here in nearly two decades. I am encouraging all Jamaicans to take the hurricane as a serious threat. It's also the strongest hurricane to ever form in the Atlantic this early in the season, linked to warming waters from climate change. Ignoring climate change is deadly and dangerous and irresponsible. Hurricane Beryl rapidly intensified as it made landfall in Grenada on Monday, devastating the islands of Petite Martinique and Caracou. The situation is grim. Uh, there is no power. Uh, there's almost complete destruction of uh, homes and buildings on the island. Officials say the storm has killed at least six people, a number they caution will likely rise. Beryl also leaving a trail of destruction in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, including ripping the roof off this school. In Venezuela, water rushed down streets as families waded through water looking for their belongings. And at this marina in Barbados, boats tossed on their sides, sitting atop piles of debris. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news right on this. Welcome back. Carlo Acutis, a teenage computer whist known as God's influencer, will become the first millennial saint. Pope Francis approved his canonization, recognizing his work, cataloging Eucharistic miracles and contributions to the community, likely occurring in 2025. Tonight, a new era for the Catholic Church. Pope Francis and a group of cardinals approving the first millennial saint for canonization. 
Carlo Acutis, an Italian teenager who's been called God's influencer, the patron saint of the internet, and is credited for using social media to spread the word of God before his death at the age of 15 from leukemia in 2006. And while his loved ones remember his kindness, the Vatican recognizing his sainthood for what they claim are two miracles. Families in Brazil and Italy say their children overcame illness after praying to Carlo. And Carlo's reach is extensive. There's a 24 seven live stream of his tomb at the Church of St. Mary Major in Assisi. It's also accompanied by a shrine. The Catholic news agency says more than 41,000 people visited the site for a celebration in 2020. Carlo Acutis is expected to officially become a saint during the church's jubilee in 2025, an event that Catholics from all over the world travel to Rome for. Now, they'll get to see Carlo's influence enshrined in the Catholic Church forever. That wraps up our world news coverage for tonight. Be sure to join us again tomorrow for more key updates from around the globe. Stay tuned as I'll be back shortly with the nightly business report. Thank you for watching. Good night.